Memoirs of a Revolutionary by Victor Serge. This is the foreword and the introduction. So the foreword is written by um, Adam Hot Hotchchild. One Night with Its Stars Askew. Some years ago, I was at a conference of writers and journalists from various countries. A group of a dozen or more of us were talking, and someone asked that each pers person say who was the political writer whom he or she most admired. When my turn came, I named Victor Serge. A man I did not know abruptly leapt to his feet, strode across the room, and embraced me. He turned out to be Rafael Barajas of Mexico, who under the pen name of El Fiskin is one of Latin America's leading political cartoonists. It is rare when a writer inspires instant brotherhood among strangers, and rarer still, and rarer still when the writing involved is not fiction or poetry. Although Victor Serge was a good novelist and poet, but a work of nonfiction. For me and for others in many parts of the world, Serge's greatness lies above all in the book you are holding. Victor Serge began and ended his life in exile and spent much of it either in prison or in flight from various governments trying to put him there. He was born Victor Kibalchich in 1890. His parents were Russian revolutionaries who had fled to Belgium. He had little formal schooling. As a child, he often had only bread soaked in coffee to eat. In Brussels, he recalled on the walls of our humble and makeshift lodgings, there were always the portraits of men who had been hanged. As a teenager and a radical group, he was one of the tiny handful of people in Belgium who boldly criticized King Leopold II's rule over the Congo, then the most brutal colonial regime in Africa. But he went farther than others in taking a stand against colonialism itself, a rare position in Europe at that time. He left home while still in his teens, lived in a French mining village, worked as a typesetter, and finally made his way to Paris. There he lived with beggars, read Balzac, and grew fascinated by the underworld. But soon the revolutionary in him overcame the wanderer. He became an anarchist and the editor of one of the movement's newspapers. For, re for refusing to testify against some comrades, he was sentenced at age 22 to five years in a French maximum security prison. Released in 1917, he eventually managed to make his way to revolutionary Russia, the ancestral homeland he had never seen. He arrived in early 1919 in a country engulfed in civil war. This brutal conflict, which took several million lives, was between the Bolsheviks and the counter-revolutionary white forces, mostly led by former Tsar's generals and supplied by England, France, and the United States. Although a supporter of the Russian Revolution, he became quickly agonized by the other, more sinister battle the Bolsheviks were fighting against virtually all the other parties of the left. They had closed down Russia's first democratically elected legislature and were now busy executing many of their political opponents. He spent most, most of the next 17 years in Russia, writing under the name Victor Serge. Among the many shrill and angry voices of that time, his still rings clear and true today. Serge never abandoned his passion for civil liberties or his sympathy for the free spirits who didn't toe the Bolshevik line. The telephone became my personal enemy, he wrote. At every hour, it brought me voices of panic-stricken women who spoke of arrest, imminent executions, and injustice, and begged me to intervene at once, for the love of God. Yet the white armies were attacking from all directions. Serge felt it was no time for intellectuals, however right their, their criticisms, to be on the sidelines. Even if there were only one chance in a hundred for the regeneration of the revolution and its workers, democracy, he later wrote, that chance had to be taken. He worked as an official of the Communist International and served as a militia officer fighting the whites. At one point, he was in charge of examining the captured archives of the Okhrana, the Tsarist secret police. At the same time, he continued to be appalled by the growth 
of a new secret police regime around him and argued ceaselessly against the straight-jacketed press, the arrests, the closed trials, and the death penalty for political prisoners. As he watched the Soviet bureaucracy grow ever more oppressive, Serge became more convinced than ever that political power should be decentralized and given to the small community in the workplace. He and some like-minded friends tried to build a miniature version of the society they believed in by founding a communal farm on an abandoned estate where we would live close to the earth. But surrounded by turmoil, famine, and distrustful villagers, the experiment didn't last. Before long, Serge was expelled from the Communist Party. In 1918, Stalin clapped him in jail. Or, sorry, 1928, Stalin clapped him in jail. Always alert to irony, Serge talked to one of his guards and found that he had served in the same job under the Tsar. A few days after his release from prison, Serge wrote, I was laid out by an unendurable abdom ab abdominal pain. For 24 hours, I was face to face with death, and I reflected that I had labored, striven, and schooled myself titanically without producing anything valuable or lasting. I told myself, if I chance to survive, I must be quick and finish the books I have begun. I must write, write. I thought of what I would write and mentally sketched the plan of a series of documentary novels about these unforgettable times. And write he did. In all of his books, and particularly in this one, his masterpiece, his prose has a searing, vivid, telegraphic compactness. Serge's style comes not from endless refinement and rewriting, like Flaubert's, but from the urgency of being a man on the run. The police are at the door, his friends are being arrested, he must get the news out, every word must tell. And he is not like the novelist in a calmer society who searches and experiments to find exactly the right subject at last. His subject, the Russian Revolution and its aftermath, almost killed him. During Stalin's dictatorship, it is estimated today somewhere between 10 and 20 million Soviets met unnatural deaths. From the deliberate famine brought on by the forced collectivization of agriculture, from the firing squads and from the Arctic and Siberian network of labor camps that devoured victims of mass arrests. Driven by Stalin's increasing paranoia, these arrests and executions peaked in the great purge of the late 1930s, when millions of Soviet citizens were seized in midnight raids. Many were never seen by their families again. Serge's opposition to Soviet tyranny meant that his work could never be published in Stalin's USSR, but his radicalism long kept much of it out of print in the United States as well. Today, however, he has won due recognition at last. Recent decades have seen studies and articles about him by many writers and a biography by Susan Weiss Weissman. <clears throat> Richard Greenman has translated a number of his novels into English for the first time. Older editions of other Serge books have been reprinted, and there is now even a Victor Serge library in Moscow. These memoirs of his life belong on the, small, on the same small shelf as the other great political treatments of the 20th century. Books like Kostler's Darkness at Noon and Orwell's Homage to Catalonia. Orwell felt akin to Serge and tried unsuccessfully to find him a British publisher. Serge was part of the generation that at first saw the Russian Revolution as an epochal step forward from the political system which, in the First World War, had just taken the lives of more than 9 million soldiers and left 21 million wounded and millions of civilian dead as well. His great hopes make all the more poignant his clear-eyed picture of the gathering darkness as the revolution turned slowly into a vast self-inflicted genocide. It was the era when, as a character in his novel, Conquered City says, we have conquered everything and everything has slipped out of our grasp. A poem Serge wrote captures the same feeling. If we roused the peoples and made the continents quake, began to make everything anew with these dirty old stones, these tired hands and the meager souls that were left us, it was not in order to haggle with you now. Sad revolution, our mother, our child, our flesh, our decapitated dawn, our night with its stars askew. Serge's eyewitness account of this 
decapitated Dawn is nowhere more tragic than in chapter 6 of this volume, where he describes coming back to Russia in 1926 after a mission abroad. A return to Russia, Russian soil rends the heart. Earth of Russia, wrote the poet Tuch, Tuchev, no corner of you is untouched by Christ the slave. The Marxist explains it in the same terms. The production of commodities was never sufficient. In the countryside, hungry poor have taken to the roads. The streets of Leningrad are filled with beggars, abandoned children, prostitutes. The hotels laid on for foreigners and party officials have bars that are complete with tables covered in soiled white linen, dusty palm trees, and alert waiters who know secrets beyond the revolution's ken. One after another, people surge knows and admires labor organizers, poets, veteran revolutionaries commit suicide. In 1933, Stalin, and S Stalin had Serge arrested again and exiled him and his family to the remote city of Orenburg in the Ural Mountains. People were starving. Children clawed each other in the streets for a piece of bread. Serge became fast friends with the other political exiles there. A small group of men and women who shared food and ideas nursed one another through illnesses and kept each other alive. Fluent in five languages, Serge did almost all his writing in French. By the time of his exile in Orenburg, his books and articles had won him a small but loyal following among independent leftists in the West, who were alarmed by both fascism and Stalinism. In 1936, protests by French intellectuals finally won him the right to leave Russia. This was the year that the Great Purge began in earnest, with mass arrests and executions on a scale unmatched in Russian history. Serge's release from the Soviet Union almost certainly saved his life. The secret police seized all copies of the manuscripts of two new books he had written, including the novel he thought his best. Thanks to his exile, Serge said wryly, these were the only works I have ever had the opportunity to revise at leisure. People have searched repeatedly for, this, for these manuscripts in Russian archives intermittently, opened since the end of communism, but with no success. When he arrived from Russia and Western Europe, Serge's pol politics again made him an outsider. Neither mainstream nor communist newspapers would publish his articles, and the European Communist parties attacked him ferociously. His primary forum was a small labor paper in Belgium. There, and in a stream of new books and pamphlets, he railed against the Great Purge, defended the Spanish Republic, and spoke out against the Western powers for accommodating Hitler. These ideas were not popular. To make ends meet, he had to work at his old trade as a typesetter and proofreader, sometimes correcting the galleys of newspapers that would not publish his writing. Meanwhile, Stalin's agents roamed Western Europe, on occasion assassinating members of the opposition in exile. Back in the Soviet Union, things were still worse. Serge's sister, mother-in-law, two brothers-in-law, and two sisters-in-law disappeared into the gulag. His wife, Luba Rus Ruskova, became psychotic and had to put in a French mental hospital and had to be put into a French mental hospital. The Germans invaded France. When Nazi tanks reached the suburbs of Paris, Serge left the city. The United States refused him a visa. The Nazis burned his books. Just ahead of the Gestapo, he and his teenage son left Marseille on a ship to Mexico. One of the many unexpected things about Serge's memoirs is that the book he thought he was writing is not exactly the one we admire him for today. In both this book and some 20 others, fiction, nonfiction, biography, history, and poetry, his driving passion was to rescue the honor of the idealists who participated in the Russian Revolution from the Stalinists, who took it over and turned it into a horror show. It is easy to understand Serge's feelings. He grew up acutely aware of the injustices of the Europe of his day, bled white by the horrendous war of 1914-18, to 18, and poured all his energy and talent into the revolution that promised to end them. But looking back on those times today, we cannot share Serge's hope that the fractious left oppositionists who coalesced around Leon Trotsky could have created the good society in Russia even though surely none of them would have constructed a charnel house as murderous as Stalin's. And indeed, Serge's brilliant capsule portrait of Trotsky in these pages shows both the man's wide-ranging intellect and his harsh authoritarian streak. 
What moves us in this book now is not so much Serge's vision of what the revolution might have been. It is rather two qualities of the man himself. The first is his ability to see the world with unflinching clarity. In the Soviet Union's first decade and a half, despite arrests, ostracism, theft of his manuscripts, and not having enough to eat, he bore witness. This was rare, although other totalitarian regimes, left and right, have had naive, besotted admirers before and since. Never has there been a tyranny praised by so many otherwise sane intellectuals. George Bernard Shaw traveled, traveled to Russia in the midst of the man-made famine of the 1930s and declared that there was food enough for everyone. Walter Duranty, the Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times correspondent in Moscow, downplayed reports of famine as a gross exaggeration. In Soviet Russia, the great muckracking journalists Lincoln Steffens saw in his famous phrase, the future that worked, as astonishing a variety of other Westerners, from the Dean of Canterbury to American ambassador Joseph Davies, saw mainly a society full of happy workers and laughing children. American Vice President Hen Henry Wallace made an official visit during World War II to the Kolurna Col region, or Kolima region, on the Soviet Union's Pacific coast. It was then the site of the densest concentration of forced labor camps ever seen on Earth, but Wallace and his entourage never noticed anything amiss. By contrast with all these cheerful visitors, Victor Serge had what Orwell in another context called the power of facing unpleasant facts. Serge's other great virtue is his novelist's eye for human character. He never lets his intense political commitment blind him to life's humor and paradox, its sensuality and beauty. You can see this in photographs of him as well, which show kindly, ironic eyes that seem to be both sad and amused by something, set in a modest, bearded face. I have always believed, he writes, that human qualities find their physical expression in a man's personal appearance. In what other revolutionary's autobiography could you find something like this? Thumbnail sketch of a French communist Serge New in Russia. Um, Guibault's whole life was a perfect example of the failure who, despite all his efforts, skirts the edge of success without ever manage, managing to achieve it. He wrote cacophonous poetry, kept a card index full of gossip about his comrades, and plagued the Cheka, the secret police, with con confidential notes. He wore green shirts and pea-green ties with greenish suits. Everything about him, including his crooked face and his eyes, seemed to have a touch of mold. He died in Paris about 1938, by then an anti-Semite, having published two books proving Mussolini to be the only true successor, successor, uh, successor of Lenin. In Serge's best novel, The Case of Comrade Tuliev, three members of the Trotskyist opposition meet on skis in the woods outside Moscow. They talk of the injustices around them, agree that things are hopeless, and that prison and early death probably await them. Then they have a snowball fight. In Memoirs of a Revolutionary, Serge describes fighting white saboteurs on the rooftops, rooftops of Petrograd in 1919, during the white night of the far northern summer, overlooking a sky blue canal, men fled before us, firing the revolvers at us from behind the chimney pots. The men we were after escaped, but I the men we were after escaped, but I treasured an unforgettable vision of the city, seen at three AM in all its magical paleness. After I first discovered Serge's writings, I tried to look for traces of him in Russia. In the summer of 1978, I visited what Serge called the city that I love above all. When he first arrived there, it was Petrograd, later Leningrad, and today, once again, is, as it was century, a century ago, St. Petersburg. I began at the Smolny Institute. Before the revolution, the Smolny was Russia's most exclusive girls' finishing school, under the personal patronage of the Tsarina. In 1917, the Bolsheviks took it over as their headquarters, and planned their coup d'etat from classrooms where daughters of the aristocracy had once studied French and Latin. Serge had his office here, as the infant revolution defended itself against the attacking white armies. In one of his novels, he describes how the barrels of cannons poked out between the school's elegant columns. Now I found the building closed to the public, the grounds were a park, 
fountains played, a warm breeze rustled the, the trees. Two old men talked on a bench. There was no suggestion of the history that had taken place at this spot. It felt ghostly by its absence. By 10 p.m., the sun had just set, but the sky still glowed with the same mysterious, magical paleness. That had caught Serge's eye, even while he was being shot at, so many decades before. In October 1919, when the revolution was menaced from all sides, Serge took up arms in defense of this city. <clears throat> He fought in the decisive hillside battle that turned back the White Army at Polkovo Heights, site of an old observatory outside of the city. Some 60 years later, a puzzled cab driver waited while my wife and I climbed the hill at Polkovo. A beech grove shaded us from the hot sun. On one side, a peasant woman in a red handkerchief walked slowly around the edge of a field in search of something. Wildflowers? Mushrooms? From the hilltop we could see the distant city. On the horizon was a gleam of gold from the towers of the fortress of St. Peter and St. Paul. This hill was as far as the White Army got. When the Whites fell back, the tide of the Russian Civil War turned. The battles died away. But the Russia that took shape was not the one that, that Serge had risked his life for. On another day we went in search of the apartment where Victor Serge and his family had lived. It was on a street lined with weathered stone buildings where gates to enclosed courtyards seemed to open onto another century. <clears throat> I found the right building and mounted marble steps, still lined by a pre-revolutionary wrought iron railing and banister. Outside the large wooden door on the top floor, there was no telling which bell to ring because it was a communal apartment with seven doorbells for the seven families who lived there. I picked one. A tenant said, wait, I'll get someone. She has lived here many years. We remained on the landing. Finally, a woman came out, stocky, broad-faced, with gold teeth and slightly suspicious eyes. She said she was 60 years old. She had lived in this apartment since she was seven. No, she said, defying my arithmetic. She did not remember the man I was asking about in my clumsy Russian. Although oddly, she did recall the Rusikovs, Serge's wife's family. But when asked about Serge, she shook her head firmly, arms crossed on her chest. <coughs> Another Niet came when I asked if we could come in. Evidently, she feared getting into trouble if she allowed a foreigner into the apartment. Anyway, she added, the whole place has been remodeled. So it is not the same as when this man, is he a relative of yours, lived here. Curiously, despite the the nose. She was happy to talk, and we stood on the landing for more than half an hour. I peered past her, trying to glimpse inside. According to Serge, the apartment had been hastily abandoned by a high Tsarist official and still had a grand piano. In the bookcase had been many vol had been the many volumes of Laws of the Empire, which, savoring the symbolism, Serge burned for heat one by one in the winter months of early 1919. I brought up Serge's name again, and suddenly her eyes narrowed. This man, was he an anarchist? Aha, so you do remember him. No, her arms crossed again firmly. She shook her head. Absolutely not. That evening, back at our hotel, I checked some dates in these memoirs. If she told me her age correctly, this woman was ten when the police knocked on that same door at midnight and arrested Serge the first time. And she was fifteen when, in front of a pharmacy still standing on a nearby corner, he was arrested again and sent into exile in the Urals. Fifteen years old. A family she shared a kitchen with. Could she really have forgotten? Did she only remember the anarchist from some later denunciation? Then I, knew, then I noticed another passage in the, in the memoirs. Serge says that in the mid-1920s, the Soviet authorities moved a young secret police officer, plus his wife, child, and grandmother, into the communal apartment to keep an eye on him. The dates fit. Was this woman the child? Even crossing the Atlantic to Mexico on the final flight of his exile-filled life, Serge never allowed himself to feel exiled. An internationalist always, he felt at home wherever there were people who shared his beliefs. He recorded the clenched fist salute his shipload of anti-Nazi refugees got from Spanish fishermen. <coughs> he organized, even at sea. Out in the Atlantic, past the Sahara coast, the stars pitch up and down above our heads. 
we hold a meeting on the upper deck between the funnel and the lifeboats. In Mexico, he stayed true to his vision as both a radical and a believer in free speech and again met resistance. Communist Party thugs at one point shot at him. On another occasion, they attacked a meeting where he was speaking, injuring some 70 people, many of them seriously. His young daughter was covered with blood from stab wounds in the body of a man who had bent over her to, to protect her. His politics cut off his access to both the mainstream and leftist pro-Soviet Mexican press. <clears throat> Book publishers were no better. He wrote anyway, finishing both his panoramic novel of The Great Purge, The Case of Comrade Tuliev, and these memoirs. He tried and failed to find an American publisher for the memoirs, and neither book appeared before his death at the age of 56 in 1947. These pages are, among many other things, a gallery of first-hand sketches of an astonishingly large proportion of the significant left-wing writers and political figures of the first half of the 20th century. One portrait is of Serge's friend Adolf Joff, a Russian Jew. Joff was from the generation of revolutionaries whose desire to change the world was matched by a deep, free-ranging curiosity about it. He read widely, and as an exile in Vienna before World War I underwent psychoanalysis by Freud's disciple, Alfred Adler. From a wealthy family, he donated his entire inheritance to the revolutionary movement. He was originally trained as a doctor and writes Serge. <clears throat> and, writes Serge, he reminded one of a wise physician who had been summoned to the bedside of a dying patient. After the revolution, Joff became a Soviet diplomat. In 1927, he returned to Moscow from his post as ambassador to Japan. Seriously ill and in despair at the direction, of the at the, direction the revolution had taken. As an act of protest, he committed suicide, leaving behind a message, message saying that he hoped his death would help reawaken the party and halt it on the path that leads to Thermidor. Serge came to Joff's apartment and helped organize the procession that accompanied Joff's body to Moscow, Novodevichy <laughs> Cemetery. <clears throat> the authorities tried to foil the march at every step. Even the most pessimistic of the marchers could not have imagined that theirs was to be the last anti-government mass demonstration permitted in Moscow for the next 60 years. In 1991, 64 years after Joff's death, I went to see his daughter, Nadezda, at her apartment in Moscow. Stalin had wiped out his opponents and their family members with such thoroughness that it was amazing to find one of them still alive. Nadezda Joff had spent some, of two some two decades of her life in prison camps and internal exile. A vibrant, gray-haired woman of 85, she was probably the last person alive in Russia who had once known Victor Serge. As the spring sun streamed through her window, we spent a morning talking about him and her father and the Russia that might have been if people like them had prevailed. Just before I left, she told me a story. A descendant of the Decembrists, reformer aristocrats who rebelled against the Tsar in the 1820s, sees a crowd demonstrating in the street and she sends her daughter outside. Masha, go and see what's going on. Masha returns and says, lots of people are out on the street. What do they want? They're demanding that no one should be rich. That's strange, says the woman. My grandfather went out onto the street and demanded that no one should be poor. The artist in Victor Serge would have liked this parable, I think, and the idealist in him would have liked its hint of the path not taken, of a revolution leading to a better society and not to one drenched in blood. He would have been in the grandfather's crowd and not the later one. In this book, you will find a man who saw both types of crowds, humans at their best and at their worst, and who left us a record of the world he knew in a voice of rare integrity. One last visit, this one in April 2002, Cornavaca, Mexico. Outside the open door, bursts of lush green vegetation climb everywhere. Sunlight reflects dazzlingly from whitewashed walls. Inside, this one-room building seems almost the size of a small gymnasium. The ceiling is dotted with more than a dozen skylights. Oil paintings lean against the walls. A table is piled high with black and white prints. 
and to one side is a large, old-fashioned iron printmaking machine with a big wheel that must be turned slowly by hand. At the far end of the room, against the back wall, is a work in progress, a giant canvas more than 23 feet high, a symphony of brilliant colors. The artist who has welcomed a friend and me to his studio is Vladi Kibalchic, Victor Serge's 81-year-old son. Three years later, he would be dead, but on this spring day, he is a spry, gray-haired man with a warm face, a flat Russian cap such as Lenin wears in photographs, and a belted Russian peasant's blouse. Depending on who comes in and out of the studio this morning, he speaks in Russian, French, or Spanish, equally at home and all. Among the books on shelves at the side of the room are volumes by his father, in many editions, and from time to time as we talk, he goes over and retrieves one to make a point. Vladi was born in revolutionary Petrograd in 1920, was, was dandled as a baby on Lenin's knee, and for the first 27 years of his life, he shared that of his father. Hunger, the arrests of family friends, exile in Orenburg in Western Europe, and then the final voyage to Mexico. Like his father, Vladi has had troubles with the authorities. The Mexican government, long proud of the country's muralists, commissioned him to do four big paintings for the Interior Ministry headquarters. They were unveiled with great public fanfare in 1994. Several months later, they disappeared. Officials had judged one of them to be too sympathetic to the Zapatista peasant rebels in the state of Chiapas. Vladi remembers well his childhood years in the 1920s and early 30s as darkness closed over Russia. Two rooms in that Leningrad communal apartment where he grew up were occupied by families of policemen, one possibly including the woman I had met, and each time Serge went to the telephone someone opened a door to listen. Serge told his young son Russian fairy tales at night and took him cross-country skiing on the snow-covered ice of the Neva River. But a normal childhood became increasingly difficult as arrests mounted in the newspapers filled with articles demanding death for people judged traitors to the revolution. The translation work on which Victor Serge depended for his income dried up. Vladi was 12 when his father was arrested for the second time. He telephoned me from his prosecutor's office. He told me that I was now the man of the house, that I had to take care of my mother to study or take care of my mother, to study, to brush my teeth, to speak French, to draw. Things were very tense at home. I went out one evening and I passed the building of the GPU, the secret police. I ran in the door. There were two soldiers with bayonets and a red carpet on a big staircase. Stop. There was a door and a man there in uniform who asked what's going on. You've arrested my father. Who is he? I remember he had a corner office. He picked up the telephone, talked, and then said, Your father is in Moscow. It's not true. He telephoned Moscow and then said, He's in the Lubyanka National Secret Police Headquarters. At home, Vladi's maternal grandparents, who were taking care of him, were aghast that he had entered the secret police building. Ten months later, the family finally received permission to join Serge in exile in Orenburg. Vladi and his mother sold their books and furniture and left for the Urals. We had, we had a particularly hard time with hunger there. People were dropping like flies. But Orenburg was where, with strong encouragement from his father, Vladi really began to draw. When Vladi speaks of Victor Serge as a human being, what he remembers most warmly is his father's calm optimism and equan equanimity. He never swore, even though he had been long in prison with some terrible people. And wherever they were, at home, in exile, on shipboard, whether there was hope of publication or not, Serge wrote. He and Vladi were stuck in an internment camp for some weeks in Martinique in 1941, trying to get to Mexico at a time when many countries were turning away refugees. Even in the camp, Serge kept writing prose and poems. Vladi makes the motion of a writer's hand holding a pen and crossing a page. He worked just as if he were at home. Have his father's beliefs influenced Vladi's art? 
One answer lies in the giant canvas on the end of the, at the end wall of his studio, which Flatty has been painting and repainting for many years. Interrupted by public view, or public viewing at an exhibition. The painting shows the Persian emperor Xerxes, who invaded Greece in 480 BC. When a storm destroyed the pond room bridges he built to cross the Dardanelles, the narrow strait between Asia and Europe, the enraged Xerxes ordered his soldiers to whip the sea in punishment. Xerxes is a cyclops in Vladi's painting, mounted on a dragon the color of fire. The soldiers whipping the deep green sea are tiny figures, in keeping with the hopelessness of their task. More than a half century after Victor Serge's death, his artist son has gone back two and a half millennia to find an image for one lesson that Serge's own life taught them both, about the folly of an autocrat's grasping for absolute power. Okay, so the translator's introduction, and I believe this is Peter... Um, Peter, I forget his last name, Peter Sedwick. Yes, it's Peter Sedwick. Okay. Victor Serge, who was born in 1890 and died in 1947, was an anarchist, a Bolshevik, a Trotskyist, a revisionist Marxist, Marxist, and on his own confession, a personalist. Belgian by place of birth and upbringing, French by adoption, and in literary expression, Russian by parentage and later by citizenship. He eventually became stateless and was put down as a Spanish national for purposes of his funeral documents. He was a journalist, a poet, a pamphleteer, a historian, an agitator, and a novelist. Usually he was several of these things at once. There were few times in his life when he did not combine at least two or three nationalities, ideologies, and professional callings. Nevertheless, although there is no way of describing him in brief without an inventory of discordances, he was very much an integral man. To read his memoirs is to receive the impression of a strong and consistent personality, of an approach to life and to politics which is complex but unified, of a heart which, however it may be divided, is so because reality tears it asunder, not because its loyalties are confused. When we list the varying political trends that entered, it, entered into Victor Serge's makeup, we are simply recording his continual sensitivity to certain perennial dilemmas of action. Serge hated violence, but he saw it at times as constituting a lesser evil. He believed that necessity in politics might sometimes be frightful, but was necessity nonetheless. Only he was not inclined to, glor to glorify it into a virtue. He mistrusted the state, but he recognized it as an inevitable form in the progress of society. So general a statement of political predicaments is doubtless banal, but it is in fact rather rare to find a public figure, let alone a revolutionary public figure, who plainly registers both extremes of a dilemma with equal sensitivity, even though his ultimate choice was, in, was or ultimate choice may incline very def definitely towards one pole or the other. An appreciation of the complexity of political choice probably does not conduce to effective left-wing theory or leadership. The improvising politician concerned above all to seek the key to social transformation. Oh, sorry, I read that weird. The improvising politician concerned above all to seek the key to social transformation has almost of necessity to overemphasize over some features of social reality at the expense of others. But the revolutionary of mixed origins and impulsions may well make a very good witness to the great upheavals of his time. Standing at the confluence of several radical traditions, he will be able to judge the programs, actions, and ideas of the competing parties with a certain detachment, and yet his detachment will not be of the uncomprehending, non-committal kind, which would make it impossible to describe the revolution at all, except perhaps as a sequence of despotic acts. Thus it is N. N. Sukhanov, an ex-social revolutionary, ex-Menshevik Bolshevik sympathizer, who is responsible for a brilliant and uniquely valuable history of the revolutionary year of 1917. To the subsequent epoch of the revolution, its opening and continuing phases of mass violence, terror, and degeneracy, Serge brings a mind already matured in the experience of heroism and its corruption. 
When he entered the service of the revolution at the age of 28, he had behind him several years of disgust with the commercialized social democracy of Belgium, three years of mounting disillusionment with anarchist terrorism, and five years unspeakable existence as a convict among convicts. Steeped in the individualist psychology of his libertarian past, he retained an intense and weary consciousness of the many-sidedness of human motivation, of man's potential both for titanic endeavor and for regression to the brute. In the writings of Serge, particular political ten tendencies stand displayed as the expression of moral and psychological resources within the individual. Not Marxism or reformism, Stalinism or liberalism are primary, but will, fear, sensitivity, dishonesty, courage, mental rigidity, psychic dynamism, and their opposites or absences. Serge tells you that a certain man is an obsessive or that he leans too much upon favor, and this information is intended to mean quite as much as the facts about his party alignment. Indeed, the political characterization is perhaps causally dependent on the more personal one. Serge often manages his evocation of the person by means of physiognomic details, how this face was puffed, that one solid looking, how certain eyes were gentle or harsh or firm. On his return to Western Europe in 1936, Serge drew a long train of political conclusions, which stood the test of time considerably better than the more catastrophic expectations of his comrades from one simple anatomic observation, that the Belgian were now fat, that the Belgians were now fat. Serge's fascination with the expressive externals of people is of particular use to him in many thumbnail portraits of revolutionists, writers, and plain folk that fill the pages of the memoirs. As Serge progresses on his various ex expeditions with the political and the literary vanguard, he leaves behind him a trail of single paragraphs or sparse sentences, each bearing the vivid imprint of a summarized personality. Gramsci, Toller, Lucas, Yesenin, Balabanova, Guide, Trotsky, Vanderveld, Pilniak, Barbousse. The improbable list could be extended indefinitely, though there would be little point in trying to do so since much of Serge's appeal lies in the most obscure of his characters. While these portrayals are succinct and bold, they are not, generally speaking, caricatures, for Serge maintains a scrupulous fairness towards his memoir memories. He can sum up, summon up a trio of German social democrats, a clique of common turn functionaries, or a collection of deadbeat illegalists, and project their living presence into the odd paragraph or so with utter sympathy, and at the same time with transparent fidelity to his own point of view. There's a passage in his novel, The Case of Comrade Tuliev, in which he shows us Stalin at the height of the purges, not as a sadist or a villain, but as a hopelessly solitary man, viewed in the white light of compassion. And yet Serge's concern for human beings is by no means the same type of concern that a non-political writer would display, confronted by the same pers personages. personages. Although Serge's portraits of political characters are rounded, nuanced, and humane, he is all the time seeing and selecting their traits from a specifically revolutionary standpoint. Basically, he is asking himself, is this man the kind of person who will help me help to make the revolution, or will he perhaps help to make the wrong kind of revolution? Towards the end of the memoirs, and again in his diaries, Serge remarks that one of the greatest problems in politics is that of reconciling intransigence, which he thought indispensable to any worthwhile con um, convictions, with the equally necessary principles of criticism towards ideas and respect towards men. Intransigence is steadfastness, is living. Nietzsche was quite right to consider possession of the truth as allied to the will to dominate. It is Victor Serge's exceptional merit as a revolutionary witness not only that he conceived of the problem at all, but also that he himself so often resolved it in a mode of perception that fused both intransigence and love. The forceful independence of Serge's vision of political processes may be traced back to a very early stage in his Bolshevik career. In August 1921, a French socialist publisher brought out a little book by Serge under the title Les 
un orchestre et l'expérience de la révolution ru russe. In it, as he himself hints on pages 133 to 34 of the memoirs, we find sometimes in rudimentary but often in quite developed form all the basic, basic concepts deployed by Serge in his later analyses of the Red Dictatorship and its totalitarian leanings. Fundamental to his critique is the distinction between the avoidable and the unavoidable aspects of degeneration and revolutions. Unlike most other supporters of Bolshevism, he does not idealize the existing regimentation or deny it for what it is. The proletarian dictatorship has, in Russia, had to introduce an increasingly authoritarian centralism. One may perhaps deplore it. Unfortunately, I do not believe that it could have been avoided. However, the role of necessity must not be invoked as an unrestricted excuse licen lic licensing any conceivable measure of despotism. The rise of a Jacobin party and its exclusive dictatorship do not then appear to be inevitable. And at this point, everything depends on the ideas which inspire the party, on the men who carry out these ideas, and on the reality of control by the masses. What is more, every revolutionary government is by its very nature conservative and therefore retrograde. Power exercises upon those who hold it a baleful influence, which is often expressed in deplorable occupational perversions. The state, which is an effective killing machine, oops, in the military sense, is less efficient in the regulation of production. One of the troubles of Red Russia is precisely that she has failed to avoid the almost total statification of production. All the greater, therefore, was the responsibility of free-thinking revolutionaries. It will be the task of libertarian communists to proclaim by their criticism and activity that the crystallization of the worker state must be avoided at all costs. The solution to the problem of all embracing state ownership must be production to the producers, that is, to the trade unions, even though this policy holds the danger that the unions will themselves turn into a new state bureaucracy. Anarchism is vindicated in its proclamation of the terrible harm residing in authority, the harmfulness of statism and authoritarian centralism. Indeed, in the very successes of the revolution, little credit is due to authority. Many things have been achieved in spite of it. Here, Serge seems to prefigure his later emphasis on the economic disadvantages of Stalinism. All the same, anarchists must be, with the revolution, unhesitating and ubiquitous, or they will be nothing. They will be communists, but in contradiction with numerous others, they will strive to preserve the spirit of freedom, and so will be gifted with a more critical approach and a sharper awareness of ultimate ends. Within any communist movement, their lucidity will make them the most formidable enemies of the climbers. The budding politicians and commissars, the formalists, pundits, and intriguers. The circumstances surrounding this essay themselves form a striking testimony to Serge's insistence in the memoirs on the comp com comparatively tolerant spirit of which the Bolsheviks were capable. Serge wrote it in Petrograd in the summer of 1920, having already spent over a year at Zinoviev's side in the administrative work of the Communist International. He was living in the principal hotel for party functionaries, the Astoria, next door to Bekiev and Yev Yevdokmov. <laughs> Les anarchistes et l'expérience de la révolution russe <laughs> was prepared for publication in the June of 1921 and published two months later. The bloody suppression of the Kronstadt mutiny, the outlawing of the workers' opposition as an anarcho-syndicalist deviation, and the banning of party factions had all taken place earlier in the year. Nevertheless, the publication of Serge's anti-statist, semi-anarchist, and pro-syndicalist booklet seems to have made no difference to his position in the party. This was not Serge's only indiscretion in that year, as chapter four of the memoirs shows. Yet after it all, he could still be entrusted with an important confidential mission in the common turn network abroad, performing conspiratorial duties in preparation of the apparently imminent German revolution. Serge does not seem to have regarded this mission as constituting some kind of demotion or banishment. 
the fraternal climate within Bolshevism was still such that a deviationist could be trusted. It is this continuous record of fundamental unorthodoxy that makes Victor Serge's record so different from most other ex-communists, most other ex-communist autobiographies. Through his personal tenacity and his intellectual pluralism, Serge could mentally balance the various risks, risks of political action, hedging, as it were, expectations which for others would, for others were staked upon a fanatic's throw of all or none, and so ensuring himself against the chances both of blind commitment and of stark disillusion. Harking back to the turbulent and frightful years of his youth, he could remark simply, Je ne regrette, regrette rien pour moi, and there is the same absence of personal remorse when he recounts his Bolshevik career. The vividness and immediacy of Serge's recollections do not strike us as being artificially tinted by hindsight, and in fact the judgments he passes on Russian events are very often repeated identically in writings separated by decades, quoted back and forth with a touch of clairvoyance, vanity. Over the last 25 years or so, considerable controversy has waxed over the question, is Stalinism the logical, organic, and inevitable continuation of Bolshevism? Most Western observers have replied with a simple affirmative and an equation of similar form, but with the signs of all quantities reversed from negative to positive, what propounded until quite recently by political algebraists within the Soviet sphere of influence. On the other hand, the Trotskyist school of Marxism has long insisted that Stalinism is the direct negation of Bolshevism, while official Soviet theory after 1956 has increasingly tended to posit much the same kind of polar opposition between Leninist norms and at least some of the excesses, abuses, and crimes of Stalin's day. Victor Serge's answer to the problem was persistently double-sided. As against Trotsky and his followers, he stresses the fatal rigidities and ambiguities of Leninist and Marxist doctrine and the sources of degeneracy in such early Soviet institutions as the Cheka. As against the pairing of Bolshevism with Stalinism, he simply describes what, in his experience, Bolsheviks and Stalinists were like and details the severe limitations set upon a free development of Soviet socialism by the Civil War and its aftermath of havoc. Serge was suspicious of any notion tending to establish historical fatalism, and this set him both against the easy appeal to necessity which Leninists and Stalinists employed in their apologias of butchery, and against the common West Western habit of regarding the degenerescence of revolutions into tyranny as virtually the only iron law which it is still permissible to detect within history. One locus in Serge's polemical writings is particularly worth citing in this respect. In 1938 and 1939, Trotskyist and libertarian circles were hotly involved in debating the nature of the Kronstadt Rising of 1921, whose ruthless liquidation by the Bolsheviks lent itself to obvious comparison with the ongoing Great Purge. Serge entered into combat both with Trotsky, who had no qualms at all about the Bolshevik treatment of the mutineers, and with a Yugoslav ex-Trotskyist, Anton Kiliga, who saw the Kronstadt rising as a proletarian revolution against the bureaucracy, and its suppression as a proof of the linear descent of Stalin's party from Lenin's. Trotsky had brusquely dismissed Serge's earlier reminiscences of the Kronstadt massacres. Whether there were any needless victims, I do not know. Only this score, I, mu I trust, Zerzinski more than his belated critics. Victor Serge's conclusions on this score from third hand have no value in my eyes. Serge retorted that his information on Kronstadt came from anarchist eyewitnesses he had interviewed in prison immediately after the rising, whereas Zerzinski's conclusions were from seventh or ninth hand the head of the Cheka, having been absent from Petrograd at the time. The single fact that a Trotsky did not know what all the rank and file communists knew, that out of inhumanity and needless crime had been committed against the proletariat and peasantry. This fact, I repeat, is deeply significant. On the other hand, Serge maintained against Kiliga that the 
sociopolitical composition of the non-party masses at the time of Kronstadt was very far from progressive. In 1921, everybody who aspires to socialism is inside the party. It is the non-party workers of this epoch, joining the party to the number of 2 million in 1924, upon the death of Lenin, who is sure the victory of its bureaucracy. The conscious revolutionaries in the leadership of the mutiny constituted an undeniable elite, and, duped by their own passion, they opened, in spite of themselves, the door to a frightful counter-revolution. Serge's comment on the general issue in question could well be taken as a summing up of his lifelong attitude to the revolution. It is often said that the germ of all Stalinism was in Bolshevism at its beginning. Well, I have no objection. Only Bolshevism also contained many other germs, a mass of other germs, and those who lived through the enthusiasm of the first years of the first victorious revolution ought not to forget it. To judge the living man by the death germs which the autopsy reveals in a corpse and which he may have carried in him since his birth is this very sensible. In one sense, the, pol the political career of Victor Serge terminated with the demise of the European left after the fall of France in 1940. He was never again able to participate in any social movement with a recognizable influence upon public events. The last six or seven years of his life passed in virtual political solitude his refugee status forbade any intervention by him in Mexican affairs, and he could find no wider international audience to hear him out. Nonetheless, Serge never at any stage retired from his vocation as a revolutionary writer. He went on writing his fine novel on the purges during the, the rout of France and the fugitives Warren of Marseilles, and on the trouble, troubled voyage that took him to his final asylum. Once in Mexico, he wrote without respite, novel essays, novels, essays, poems, articles, biography, and autobiography, anxious to keep abreast of the major social and cultural developments of the time. He devoured every significant book, periodical or journal that he chanced on in Russian, French, Spanish, German, or English. He kept a voluminous diary, amassed material on Mexican history and culture and sent off long political letters to a circle of friends abroad, as well as to any prominent foreign publicists that he felt like criticizing. The lengthy studies he undertook as rapporteur to a small socialist exile group destined for the eyes of a mere handful are composed with the same measure and density as the works he intended for publication. All these millions of words were typed by Serge in cramped single spacing on reams of the cheapest flimsy with rarely an erasure or amendment. When one manuscript was finished, he went straight on to the next without looking back. Reading over the text of the memoirs, his friend Julian Gorkin remarked that the, that the book was condensed and excessively laconic through the adoption of this telegraphic style. Surely material so rich should be developed and expanded. Serge gave a skeptical smile and answered, what would be the use? Who would publish me? And besides, I am pressed for time. Other books are waiting. He worked on sometimes with a haunting sense that his faculties might be weakening through the sheer vacuity that surrounded him. Terribly difficult, he notes, to create in the void, lacking the least support, the least real environment. He speaks of writing for the desk drawer alone, past the age of 50, unable to exclude the hypothesis that the tyrannies will outlast the remainder of my life. And I am beginning to wonder if my very name will not be an obstacle to the novel's publication. This, oppre this oppressive sense of failure was not without its foundation in recent experience. As soon as Serge arrived in Mexico, he paid his familiar penalty for his clairvoyance. His book on the Nazi aggression against Russia, Hitler contra Stalin, proved to be too frank for the public taste since it predicted disastrous Soviet Reverse, reverses in the early stages of the war, with the peasants actually welcoming Hitler's invaders. As a result, the small firm that had published the book expired in ruin. Serge's dark forecasts turned out, of course, to be perfectly, perfectly accurate. Public meetings addressed by Serge, Gorkin, and others from their circle were brutally assailed by communist groups, on one occasion by an armed gang of 200 men. Several times he and his friends had to go into hiding. At his, at his lodgings, which he seldom left if he could help it, 
He had a spy hole cut into the front door so that he could identify callers before opening to them. The danger was not always so bluntly physical. A protracted barrage of slander was directed against Serge in a circle by the many organs of the Mexican press, influenced by the communists and their pow powerful associates, such as the trade union leader Lombardo Toledano. The strong German Stalinist emigration, including such veteran propagandists as Andre Simon, or Katz, and Paul Merker, added their quota of venom to the campaign. Serge's friends were socialist militants of long standing, like Marceau Pever, the leader of the pre war French socialist left, Gustave Regler, lately a political commissar with the international brigades in Spain, Julian Gorkin, the former international secretary of the independent Marxist party, PUM, and other Spanish comrades of that complexion. Nevertheless, they, and Serge and Gorkin particularly, were incessantly denounced as Nazi agents, enemies of the United Nations, allies of the Sinarchistas, or local fascists, founders of a new Trotskyist international, and fomenters of railway strikes. One by one, Mexican publications closed their columns to this obscure band of troublesome foreigners. The editor of One Weekly, which still admitted Gorkin as its foreign editor and Serge as a contributor, was called in to see Miguel Ailman, the Minister of the Interior and future President of the Republic. There he was informed that the Soviet and British ambassadors were pressing the Mexican government to withdraw from Serge and Gorkin all public means of expression. Although the editor refused to accede, his journal afterwards acquired a new management enjoying the favor of the Soviet embassy. And he, Gorkin and Serge, were, on, were all unceremoniously ousted. The boycott was now total and Serge found it increasingly hard to keep body and soul together. Only one more book of his saw print during his life, a novel published in Canada and in, and in translation in the United States. He tried in vain to get the memoirs published in the USA. In every publishing house, he bitterly concluded, there's at least one conservative and two Stalinists, and nobody has the slightest understanding of the life of a European militant. He died penniless, and his friends had to make a collection among themselves to pay the expenses of his burial. The estrangements and dissensions typical of emigre political groups bore particularly heavily upon Serge. Within the independent socialist colony, he was the only member with a specifically Bolshevik background. His collaboration with socialists from other traditions was warm and unstinted, but we can gain some inkling of a certain isolation that he felt to judge from a note he entered in his diary in mid-January 1944. Here he records his pleasure at the resumption of friendly relations with Trotsky's widow, Natalia, noting how they, the sole survivors of the Russian Revolution here, and perhaps anywhere in the world, used to be separated so completely by sectarianism, and this was not like the human spirit of the real Bolsheviks. He reflects that Natalia is going to be pained by certain anti-Trotskyist observations in a book which he had just brought out in, in co-authorship with his friends. She will perhaps not realize my solitude in these collaborations. He concludes sadly, there's nobody left who knows what the Russian Revolution was really like, what the Bolsheviks were really like, and men judge without knowing, with bitterness and basic rigidity. Yet in other respects, Serge was far too much of a revisionist for his more traditional Marxist comrades, many of whom were nursing hopes for their post-war return to the old world on the crest of a European revolution. Serge had no such hopes. For him, the Second World War was a war of social transformation, and not simply a classical imperialist war as nearly all his comrades thought. Ushering in an era of controlled and planned economies that would, under the conditions of post-war reconstruction, burst the fetters of capitalist private property, even in the absence of proletarian upheavals. European big capital, weakened and discredited by the war it is brought on, will find itself in opposition to the growth of production and the common good, now in clear evidence. Serge believed that this inevitable collectivist transformation would have a, a marked totalitarian bias, 
which could, however, be largely counteracted by class struggle on the political level. I lost my spot. Parliaments, municipalities, trade unions, and workers' councils offered a possible focus for this countervailing influence by the masses. Serge maintained this perspective well after the war. I wonder if some kind of collectivism, quasi-totalitarian, but enlightened, guaranteeing the human rights that have been acquired over several centuries, will not eventually establish itself for the reconstruction of the old continent. Such a system I would find acceptable if it were directed by technicians and effectively controlled by the masses. So pessimistic an outlook, based, despite its undoubted insights, upon speculative impressionism rather than, rather than on any thorough economic analysis, could not fail to irritate most of his comrades. Their charges of techn technocratism, just one more little deviation in my life history, as he remarked, irked him, and he in his turn could not take seriously their pipe dreams for an insurrectionary post-war settlement in Europe. There was no basis for the growth of mass revolutionary parties in the conditions of occupied Europe, and in any case nowadays, a popular revolution which possesses no airplanes will inevitably be beaten. There could be no question any longer of a specifically proletarian hegemony. The vanguard must be sought preponderantly within the growing social strata of technicians and white collar employees. The education of the working class has to be managed afresh. Serge's reflections on the Western social order are suggestive, but often highly ambiguous. He was on surer ground as a commentator upon Soviet perspectives, which he indeed saw as determining the direction of all politics, and especially socialist politics in the rest of Europe. He shared none of the current illusions that the Grand Alliance of Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin would survive the end of hostilities with Germany. As early as January 1944, we find him noting that Stalinist hegemony over Europe would not be a liberation, but a new nightmare, and that it would also mark the beginning of the Third World War. Serge's last years were increasingly clouded by this prospect of the permanent war, as he terms it in a diary entry for October 1944, anticipated by him at a time when Western politicians often displayed the most grotesque naivete over Stalin's intentions. Rarely can his sense of the appalling powerlessness of accurate prediction have afflicted him so acutely as when he watched the unfolding of the promised nightmare. Stalinist subjugation of Eastern Europe, extremist demands for preventative nuclear war on the Western side. The letters and notebooks of this period reflect the division of his fears between the threat of Stalinism and the threat of war. It would be possible to to exert fragments of these sources in such a way as to present either a pro-Western Victor Serge or a kind of new left archetype, repelling both capitalism and communism with a libertarian disgust. The truth must be that within a man of Serge's loyalties, the Cold War engendered contradictions, which he could only express, never surmount. Serge was convinced that the sources of Soviet expansionism lay in the extreme inner weakness of the social organism underneath the totalitarian armor. In an unpublished essay written in English, he observes, the training of a popular revolution who has survived against the worst odds has formed in the governmental circles a mentality of offensive bluff and courageous risk, daily expediency, belief only in force and fact. In the greatest danger, the regime will not think of retreat, evolution, compromise, but, a, but of an offensive struggle in which compromises are expediency, more apparent than real. In Serge's view, the post-war era might evolve along any of three possible directions. If the Soviet system yielded neither to internal or nor external pressure, there would be war. Alternatively, the regime might back down in the international field while refusing any concessions at home. War is then postponed, but not removed altogether, or again under the combined pressure of the masses at home and of the international conflicts, which will arise in various ways. The regime may try and evolve towards a democratization. Upon the slightest relaxation of terrorist totalitarianism, immense possibilities are opened out 
which may cause the emergence in Russia of a socialist-inclined or socialist democracy and permit a peaceful collaboration with the world outside. The nightmare of war is then removed. It was, in fact, this last possibility that aroused Serge's closest interest. His papers and letters refer repeatedly to the idea of something quite odd and unforeseen happening in Russia, which would transform the situation most favorably for its people and for the world outside. Serge is deliberately vague as to what this change might consist of. <laughs> It is certainly not an anti-Stalinist revolution of the kind advocated by Trotsky. He calls the prospect one of internal crisis, change of regime in Russia, or of a great Soviet reform. One illuminating episode of March 1944, recorded subsequently in his diary, indicates the strength of Serge's conviction on this score. He had met Trotsky's grandson, Siova Volkov, on a bus. Siova was about 17 years old at this time and was understandably bitter about things Russian. <clears throat> in, in the course of his childhood, his mother had been driven to suicide in Berlin and his father had disappeared forever in Russia. Having taken refuge with his grandfather in Mexico, the boy had had to crouch beneath a bed, wounded in the foot, amidst a hail of machine gun bullets directed throughout the house by the artist Sikwaros. He had lived in the same house in the time when Trotsky was murdered by an agent who had ingratiated himself with the whole family. Siova now told Serge that he had completely forgotten the Russian language. You'll have to learn it then, said Serge. What for? Siova replied violently. At a sentimental attachment? No, thank you. And Serge answered, Russia will be changing a great deal before very long. We must remain faithful to her and keep up great hopes. This long-term optimism of Serge, which now seems uncannily prescient, arose from the same source as his dark immediate forebodings. From a certain belief, based on long personal experience in Russia, that the terrorist edifice of Stalinism was founded on unendurable social strains, which had been accentuated even further by the ruin of the Second World War. He probably, too, still believed that what he called the moral capital of the socialist revolution had still not been exhausted, even by the long years of blood and lies. Serge had been one of the first people, before anybody else, he thought, to use the word totalitarian of the Soviet state. But unlike some Western thinkers, he did not mean it to imply a finished impervious and stable structure, governed omnipotently at the top by considerations of pure power. The detail of his pr prediction, where there was detail at all, might be fanciful. A few days before he died, he told his son Vladi, I won't live to see this, but you probably will. Monuments to Trotsky and to Stalin in the public squares of Russian cities. There is no reason to suppose that he would have regarded the Russian regime of 1963 as the socialist inclined or socialist democracy of his hopes. Nevertheless, in broad outline and to an astonishing degree, Serge's sense of Soviet reality, of its double-sidedness for the future as well as for the past, has been justified by the turn that events have in fact taken. To say this much is not to elevate Serge into an expert oracle, a sort of Nostradamus, of 20th century revolutionism. Because his background and experience were so intensively Russian, he is sometimes a much less valuable guide to certain areas of politics outside the frontiers of the Soviet Union itself. His references to colonial nationalist movements in the memoirs as elsewhere are nearly always distant or disparaging. Later in life, he tended to regard all non-Russian communist parties of whom he had never held a very high opinion as little more than extensions of the Kremlin and NKVD apparatus. When in late 1944, he encountered the suggestion that communist led resistance movements might develop an autonomous character, free of Muscovite control, his response was wholeheartedly scornful. There were only totalitarian communist conductieri of the Mao Zedong or Tito type 
cynical, and convinced, who will be revolutionary or counter-revolutionary, or both simultaneously, depending on the orders they receive, and capable of an about-face from one day to the next. It would, of course, be senseless to reproach Serge for not foreseeing the Yugoslav and Chinese schisms of communism, but enough has been said to suggest that his clairvoyance was principally that of an exceptionally sensitive eyewitness and participant of the Bolshevik movement. About, for, about Victor Serge's death, as in his final life, there was a, reti a retiring quality. He had been in poor health over a number of years, with a record of heart attacks going back to his convict years in France. <clears throat> the high altitude of Mexico City did not suit his condition, and even his long lyrical excursions into country parts could offer small convol conv convalescence after the years of deprivation and persecution. In the middle of 1947, he suffered two attacks of angina. He looked frightfully old and tired, but was optimistic and full of plans. There were hopes of publication for the case of Comrade Tuliev from Canada, France, and the USA, of collaboration with Mexican reviews, even of a possible visa for the United States. Early in the small hours of Monday, November 17th, he read his wife a poem he had just written. It was a meditation on a Renaissance terracotta of a pair of hands, old and with knotted veins. Serge had tears in his eyes as he read the poem out. The hands symbolized generations of human suffering and resistance, and the knots on them were so like those of his own veins. What astonishing contact, old man, your hands established with, your, with our own. How vain the centuries of death before your hands. The artist, nameless like you, surprised them in the act of grasping. Who knows if the gesture still vibrates or has just ended. He went to bed after typing the poem and had his breakfast around 10 the next morning, discussing anthropology with his wife, something about the mystical significance of gold. She had to go to work then. There's no record of the rest of Serge's day until 8 in the evening when he went out to see his son, Vladdy. He wanted, he wanted to have a talk about Vladdy's paintings, but his son was not at home. He met his friend Julian Gorkin in the street. They talked for a while and shook hands when they parted. This would be around 10 p.m. Not long after that, doubtless feeling himself Ill, Ill, Serge hailed a taxi, sank back into the seat and died without telling the driver where to take him. His family found him stretched out on an old operating table in a dirty room inside a police station. Gorkin recounts what he looked like. His upturned soles had holes in them. His suit was threadbare, his shirt coarse. Really, he might have been some vagabond or other picked up from the streets. Victor Serge's face was stiffened in an expression of ironic protest and by means of a bandage of cloth. The state had at last closed his mouth. <clears throat>